To many people, the advice and arguments that Mary Wollstonecraft is providing in her vindication of the rights of women, or at least the sections that we're looking at, that pertain to issues like marriage, love, sexual desire, and friendship, might seem a bit out of date, a bit old-fashioned, a bit bourgeois, but as we're going to see when we look at them a bit more closely, they have a, a, a more perennial application. They, they apply to the conditions of our own time, perhaps just as well as she thought that they did to her own time and culture. What we're going to do here is look at some of the features of, of her account of this. We're piecing these together from various places within the, the uh, text. And then we'll look at how she thinks about attraction within the context of marriage. And we could talk about, we could broaden this to any sort of uh, exclusive or monogamous relationship. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then we'll look at two cautionary tales and a better account that she's providing as sort of models or examples of what might be happening, depending on the personal development. And <clears throat> so if we, if we go back to one of her her key mottos or key passages. She tells us that the two sexes mutually corrupt and improve each other. So what goes on in terms of women's development affects men's development. What goes on in terms of men's development or lack thereof affects women. And we can understand this in both an individual way and in a societal way. So if there's a low level of moral development within society, or, you know, you might say things are getting worse and worse and worse, not only in terms of social conditions or institutions, but in terms of the individual characters of particular persons, that is going to screw things up for everybody else. It makes things tougher for the next generation that comes along uh, in a whole different, you know, whole set of, of ways that we don't have to, you know, chart out at this point, but you can think out on your own. And it also makes conditions in general tougher, in, you might say, in the aggregate. When we're talking about finding somebody who you would actually want to spend time with as a companion, or maybe even hitch up to in some sort of institutional way, if the pool of people that's available is mostly... Uh, people of low caliber, not so much intellectually, but morally, Wollstonecraft would say, then you're going to have a much tougher time maintaining your own character in, in doing so, unless you decide, well, I'm just going to take myself out of circulation with respect to that. And she does actually counsel that at a certain point. Not advice that she followed, by the way, in her, in her own life, but she had a very interesting approach to this. So, you know, if we go on, she doesn't take the attitude that many people have had in her own time, <clears throat> in our time, and in other times and cultures, that in some ways men and women differ when it comes to sexual desire, to attraction, to, you might say, romantic feelings towards, towards the other. Um, there have been cultures and times in which women were supposed to be these, these you know, pure creatures who have very weak feelings in, in relation to men uh, or in comparison to men, and men are the ones who are driven by sexual desire. There's other times in cultures in which it was argued that the opposite was the case, that women were the ones who were really much more um, you know, involved with, with these sorts of pleasures, much more uh, or desires, much more driven by them. And Wollstonecraft says, no, it's, it's really about half and half. Um, and we shouldn't try to, you know, rule these out. These are natural. Um, it's, it's part of human nature to be attracted to somebody, at least, um, for it not just to be merely about sex or about um, sexual pleasure, but also about some sort of attachment, some sort of attraction, some sort of connection with the other person. So she thinks that this is not, in and of itself, something that's bad. Um, it becomes bad when it goes against rationality. And that brings us to the, uh, the next point, which is that love, by its very nature, according to Wollstonecraft, 
is an arbitrary and irrational passion. You remember when we talked about the passions, the passions are these basic emotions, drives, desires that move us and they can be subordinated to reason, they can be you know, susceptible to listening to reason, but they are not in and of themselves rational or, or reasonable. They tend to go over uh, their boundaries. So she says that um, it will rain like some other stalking mischiefs by its own authority without deigning to reason. And she also points out, too, in that same passage, that love can be easily distinguished from esteem, the foundation of friendship, because it is often excited by evanescent beauties and graces. And she says, though to give an energy to the sentiments, something more solid must deepen their impression and set the imagination to work to make the most fair the first good. So love is something that we feel, and she's using love as kind of an umbrella term for everything ranging from straight out, you know, sexual desire and infatuation to the, you know, longing to be near the other person, to have the other person looking at you, engaging with you, and everything in between. Um, as a matter of fact, she'll even talk about true love at a, at a certain point as being something that, that kind of goes beyond this, but we're not going to worry about that here. So love, in the sense of romantic love, is going to be something that happens to us and it's, it's arbitrary. It's hard to predict. Um, you know, there, there's some uh, predictors, I suppose, for it. Uh, otherwise, you couldn't be trained, as she's complaining is the case, to, to pay so much attention to love. But um, again, it's, it's very difficult to say who's going to fall in love with who or for what reasons, um, unless we're actually dealing with something that, that starts to take us beyond love itself. So... As we're looking at this, she's going to say, um, how, how do people actually fall in love? Common passions are excited by common qualities. Love is a common passion, something that, that you know, we see across the board. That's why we have so many romantic comedies and, and so many you know, dramas and, and all these sorts of you know, uh, literary and poetic and musical products that, that deal with it. It's a common passion. It's going to be felt by human beings throughout the, the course of, of human existence. And so she says it's excited by common qualities. There are some things that we can look to. What are they? She says, men look for beauty and the simper of good humor docility. So men are attracted to some sort of standard of beauty, which varies uh, admittedly from, from time to time, from culture to culture, even from uh, subculture to subculture. Uh, within our own society. And she's saying men are attracted to something outward, something that they can see, something that they, can become part of their, their imagination. Also, by good humor docility. So going along to get along, you might say. Now, you know, that's, that's a big, broad statement. She's not saying all men. She's saying this is something that if you observe across time, you can see is a, a fairly constant reason for why people love. What about women? She says, women are captivated by easy manners. A gentleman-like man sel seldom fails to please them, and their thirsty ears eagerly drink the insinuating nothings of politeness, whilst they turn from the unintelligible sounds of the charmer reason, charm he never so wisely. And she's going to talk about a character that we call the rake, in, in this, nowadays we call those players. Um, some men are, are, you know, more attractive to women. She, notice that she's not talking so much about the physical, although I think in our own time that's probably assumed a much greater role for, for uh, women and, and their attractions. Um, but she's talking about things that we can easily relate to. Who do women like? Men who actually listen to them. Men who say nice things. Men who, you know, observe basic politenesses, who, who spend the time to treat them as if they, they, they matter, as if they're important. And these are the things that attraction is very often built upon. Um, does this guarantee that it's sort of like, you know, an automatic cause and effect? You just, you know, hold the door open for somebody and suddenly they'll, you know, hearts appear over their, their image and they're in love with you? No, because again, arbitrary, right? hard to uh, decide exactly when it's going to occur. But these are some, some fairly common things. Um, it, it, she goes on and she says something that's, uh, that's very interesting. It'll be more important when we get over here. Um, 
are we attracted to other qualities in people? Are there things that we find attractive about them? A lot of us give lip service when we're asked, when we're put on the spot to, yeah, I want somebody with these qualities, these qualities, these qualities, these qualities. But if you actually pay attention to the kind of people that they ask out, the kind of people that they go on dates with, the kind of people who they talk about, that may not always be the case. So our moral qualities or intellectual qualities, some of what we're looking for in another person. Wollstonecraft thinks that the answer is yes, but only some of the time. And it depends on the person who's actually doing the looking. So, you know, she's got some great rhetoric here. She says, um, rendered gay and giddy by the whole tenor of their lives. She's talking about, you know, women who are, are easily taken in by, by rakes here. The very aspect of wisdom or the severe graces of virtue must have a lugubrious appearance to them. It's a nice word there. And produce a kind of restraint from which they they love sport from which they and love sportive child naturally revolt. So, you know, somebody may say that they value honesty, um, but when they really encounter genuine honesty in the other person, and not the not the sort of fake honesty that consists in just being a jerk and saying, you know, mean things and saying, I'm being honest with you, but real honesty, um, they may actually be repulsed by that. They may prefer somebody who tells them pleasant lies to somebody who actually tells them the truth, who says it's important to, to engage things as, as, as they are. Um, same thing with courage. You know, a lot of people talk about loving courage, but when you see somebody really exhibiting it, that can be kind of scary. And then it calls for courage on your own part to endure their own courage. And we could go on with other moral virtues as well. Generosity is a great one. Sometimes people say that they want generosity, but it really means that they want generosity with respect to them, not with respect to other people. You know, A generous person is somebody who gives at the right time, to the right degree, to the right people in terms of time, money, attention, all, all these sorts of things that we value. And so if, you, you know, if you're going to say that you love somebody for their generosity, you know, you're not really loving them for their generosity as a virtue if you only like the fact that they buy you stuff and pay attention to you. So if you don't have these qualities yourself, or at least if you're not on the way to having them, it's going to be very difficult to appreciate them. You might say there's kind of like a club of the virtuous, and the virtuous get it, and the non-virtuous don't. So she goes on and she says, Without taste, excepting of the lighter kind, for taste is the offspring of judgment. She's talking about our, our sensibilities about these things. How can they discover that true beauty and grace must arise from the play of the mind? Virtue takes mental cultivation. She's also talking about the cultivation of our intelligence, of our, our mental as well as moral faculties. And again, you know, sometimes people say, yeah, I want somebody who's smart, but, you know, the real litmus test for that is put them together on a date with somebody who is genuinely smart and then see whether they're turned on or turned off by it. If they're turned off by it, then they don't really want somebody who's smart. And it's probably because they haven't cultivated their mental faculties that much. You know, if they're the kind of person who likes to think and talk and cliches, they're probably not going to want somebody who's a critical thinker or somebody who goes beyond that. And, you know, vice versa, the kinds of people who actually are virtuous, the kinds of people who have developed their mental faculties, probably are not going to, to have an easy time uh, in romantic involvements with other people who haven't done that sort of thing. So, you know, she goes on and she says, um, how can they be expected to relish in a lover what they do not or very imperfectly possess themselves? The sympathy that unites hearts and invites to confidence in them is so very faint, it cannot take fire and thus mount to passion. A beautiful phrase there about what love does. There has to be some sort of basis, some sort of fuel, and that's what you know ignites, and that's what gives us the passion of love. And she says, no, the love cherished by such minds must have grosser fuel. Like, say, just having sex. Or, you know, indulging in, in other easy-to-pursue to things, like sitting around and smoking and drinking and watching movies constantly. You know, the sort of lowest common denominator uh, consumerist things in our society. 
So that's a lot about love being an arbitrary and irrational passion. You notice that as we get more and more towards virtue and mental cultivation, the less arbitrary it turns out to be. But if we're at the lower level, it can be just about anything. Yeah, I, I like the same music as that person. That's what, you know, teenagers do. Uh, that's how they end up hooking up together. So, um, what else? As a passion, Wollstonecraft thinks that love cannot be maintained for very long. Why is that? Well, that's the very nature of passions. Our emotional life, unless it's grounded on something much more solid, much more stable, is going to be constantly shifting. And that's going to lead to a lot of problems when we get over here and talk about marriage itself and what happens in its, in its context. Um, now, she also is going to say that women's education, remember, education means something more broad than just academic education. It means all of the sort of training, examples, modeling, messages that we're getting from society, from professions, the workplace, from uh, our friends and family, and also from our own experience. She's saying women's education is far too focused on love and that that has bad effects for women. But also, remember, because the two sexes, like she says, mutually corrupt or improve each other, it also has bad effects on men as well. So she says, um, at one point, this is kind of an interesting contention, were women more rationally educated, could they take a more comprehensive view of things, they would be contented to love but once in their lives. And after marriage, calmly let passion subside into friendship, into that tender intimacy which is the best refuge from care, yet is built on such pure, still affections that idle jealousies would not be allowed to disturb the discharge of the sober duties in life or to engross the thoughts that ought to be otherwise employed. Now, if you hear that and you say, that sounds really boring, um, that's probably a sign, Wollstonecraft would say, that your education in terms of you know, what a human being should be about, what human nature is supposed to be realizing, and the role of love in it is a little bit off. And she thinks that this is something that's, that's quite widespread in society. She says, men have too much occupied the thoughts of women. And this association has so entangled love with all their motives of action and to harp a little on an old string, having been solely employed either to prepare themselves to excite love or actually putting their lessons in practice, they cannot live without love. So what's she criticizing there? She's saying that many women, and I think this is something that we could also say about some men as well, many women have gotten the message over and over and over again, that the basic business of their being is to please men, to arouse the desire of men, to satisfy the desire of men, to get men to love them because of that, to love in that way. And they become more and more centered around that to, to the exclusion of other things, like the development of their mental faculties, the development of virtues. Um, this is going to lead to some serious problems when we talk about marriage. So let's, let's focus on that now. Um, now, Wollstonecraft is talking about marriage, and she's an interesting character. Um, you know, you might say, hey, what about, you know, single moms, or, you know, the hookup culture, or, you know, one-night stands, or, um, you know, people who don't get married but really love each other and stay together for a long time. You know, Wollstonecraft actually experienced some of that stuff. She had a child out of wedlock with this guy, uh, Imlay, who threw her over. Um, she ends up marrying a guy, William Godwin, who had written tracts against marriage and took a lot of heat for marrying her. And actually, the first night that she and William Godwin met, long before that, she and him stayed up you know, late in the night arguing with each other about um, matters of, of politics and social policy and you know, things along those lines. So, you know, she, if you were actually to sit her down and, like, make these, these criticisms to her, she would be, you know, a pretty easy person to, to uh, come up with responses uh, on her own part. When we're talking about marriage, if, if, if the word marriage bothers you here, substitute any sort of, uh, you know, relationship that is intended to have permanency, which is based on some sort of attraction. 
The key question for her is, what's this attraction going to be? What is its basis? So, you know, she, she actually says, um, this is a nice little passage, to speak disrespectfully of love is, I know, high treason against sentiment and fine feelings. But I want us to speak the simple language of truth and address the head rather than the heart. To endeavor to reason love out the world to be, to out Quixote Cervantes, that means to, you know, do try to do something that's just totally silly and equally offend against common sense. But to an endeavor to restrain this tumultuous passion appears less wild. She's saying, you know, look, we, we're going to fall in love. That's going to happen to us. But that shouldn't be the basis that runs everything. Why? Because it's going to lead to all sorts of problems. So she says, um, let me reason with the supporters of this opinion. The, the opinion is that of Rousseau, who says that you know, women should be pleasing to men, uh, who have any knowledge of human nature. Do they imagine that marriage can eradicate the habitude of love? The woman who has only been taught to please will soon find that her charms are oblique sunbeams and that they cannot have much effect on her husband's heart when they are seen every day, when the summer is past and gone. So this is one of the problems with the kind of love that she's talking about there. It's ephemeral. It doesn't last forever. It's based on, on what you have um, and what you can offer and that, after a while, is going to pale. Just, you know, because it's at the same level of, of the sensuality of other things. Think about food, you know. I mean, there are some people who can eat the same can of beans every day for the rest of their lives. but Those are pretty rare. Most of us <clears throat> like some sort of variety when it comes to sensible enjoyments. So if the love is really just based on, I think that, you know, that she's pretty, or I think that, that he's handsome, um, that's not going to last very long. Those feelings are going to start to ebb. They're going to start to go away. What's going to be left in its place? That's the key question. So she says, will she then have sufficient native energy to look into herself for comfort? If, if a woman, and the same thing would apply to a man, hasn't cultivated themselves, if they haven't acquired enough virtue to actually be on their own and be happy with who they are, because those who aren't virtuous aren't really happy being by themselves. That's why they always need to have the TV on or the radio on or something, some chatter to make sure that they're not having to be alone with their own thoughts. Um, if she can't do that, then what else is she going to do? She says, um, is it not more rational, rational to expect that she will try to please other men? So, you know, this is where, and again, we can draw this in other things as well. This is where what we call emotional affairs, as well as, you know, actual physical affairs, start up. Looking for that affection, looking for that attraction that was there and now is missing, because it was only based on something that couldn't support that weight, that couldn't support that duration of time. So she says, in the emotions raised by the expectation of new conquests, endeavor to forget the mortification her love or pride has received. So if she's not finding her husband attracted to her anymore, that hurts. And by finding somebody else with whom there can be a mutual attraction, that can make one feel better, at least for a short time. And then that could lead to another and another and another. So she says... Um, when the husband ceases to be a lover, and the time will inevitably come, her desire of pleasing will then grow languid, or become a spring of bitterness, and love, perhaps the most evanescent of all passions, gives place to jealousy or to vanity. Either the person like turns in on themselves and says, forget everybody, you know, and they're not involved in like, you know, going out and improving themselves, developing themselves as, as persons, but just in, in indulging themselves, or... They find somebody else. Is this the only possibility? Uh, Wollstonecraft doesn't think so. Um, she goes on, and she she says um, that what, what should really be going on, here we go, the woman who strengthens her body and exercises her mind will, by managing her family and practicing various virtues, become the friend and not the humble dependent of her husband. 
and a she possessing such substantial qualities merit his regard, she will not find it necessary to conceal her affection, nor to pretend to an unnatural coldness of constitution to excite her husband's passions. What, what is she talking about there? Let's put that in more uh, common sense, uh, everyday terms. She's saying, first of all, that if a woman has actually cultivated virtue in herself, good character traits, the same kind of good character traits, by the way, that Wollstonecraft says that men should be cultivating, then it's possible to have a basis of friendship after the passion is gone. And that doesn't mean that they won't be attracted to each other romantically, sexually at all. As she says, you know, a woman in this sort of state of mind will, will actually find her husband attractive. He will actually find her attractive. She won't need to conceal her affection nor pretend to an unnatural coldness of constitution. That means playing hard to get. That means, you know, playing these kind of games where, you know, you withhold affection or withhold sex or pretend not to notice the other person. She won't need to do that in order to provoke that. Friendship provides a stronger basis. Now, what if the man doesn't possess virtue? Well, then there's the possibility, as she says, of compassionate tenderness. Um, the kind of feeling that you would have towards somebody who can't do any better. Um, now, you know, she's not saying that's, that's preferable to friendship. The best thing is to have two people who are actually virtuous growing uh, alongside each other and experiencing and, and learning from each other. But, you know, if you've got somebody who's just kind of a schmuck, well, what are you going to do? Um, you can just split up with them. That's a possibility. Or you can treat them badly, try to drive them away. Or you can at least be compassionate towards them. Why? Because that actually maintains one's own virtue. That is a sign of some of the virtues. Something that would be demanded of it. She also talks about fondness. And when she's talking about fondness there, she means the sort of feeling that you would have towards your pet. Um, not, not, not the people who actually think that their pets are people, but the people who view uh, animals as something that, that are you know, fundamentally lower than human beings and incapable of the kind of development that human beings are. So that's not going to be a good basis either. And fondness, like she says, is no substitute for friendship. The only thing that can really keep, um, or the only things that can really keep a marriage or a relationship, this might actually be extended to friendship as well, uh, friendships, you know, in a broader sense, keep them going are these kind of qualities, or, or, or you might say arrangements of friendship and compassion. The feeling of love is not going to do it. A feeling of sort of fondness is not going to do it because it actually conceals a kind of contempt uh, that's going on at the same time. So she says, um, friendship or indifference inevitably succeeds love. Passions are spurs to action and open the mind, but they sink into mere appetites and become a personal and momentary gratification when the object is gained and the satisfied mind rests in enjoyment. So, you know, what does that mean? You, you find the person and you're attracted to them and you pursue them. Maybe they pursue you at the same time. You get married. Now everything's going to be easy street. No, now is when it's actually going to get a lot tougher in Wollstonecraft's uh, point of view because, you know, eventually that passion is going to fade and, and what's going to be left in its place. It's either going to be some sort of indifference or, you know, something lesser or it's going to be friendship. And what's left of the, you know, sensual affection is going to turn into mere appetite, just wanting to, to have sex, um, which by itself isn't really a basis for a lasting relationship. It has to be a lot more than that. Now, I, I said that Wollstonecraft's ideas could apply um, to a lot of other cases that she's not considering. Could this also, you know, this whole matrix, be applied to same-sex attraction? I don't see any reason why it couldn't. Um, you know, don't we have the same sort of dynamic going on where people get together because they are attracted to each other and there's some sort of passion of love if they're not just, you know, wanting to have sex, um, which, is, which is a possibility too. But they, they feel something towards each other and then that burns out. And what's left? Is it fondness? Oh, you poor thing. I'll just stick with you. 
Is it a, a genuine compassion for the other? Or is it at friendship? If there's going to be any sort of friendship possible, it's going to be on the basis of developing into the kinds of people who are capable of feeling and maintaining genuine friendships. So it's going to require virtue. Um, even if it's a, a relationship between women and women. Um, <clears throat> same thing might, might hold, you know, even if we take marriage out of the picture and we say just cohabitating for a long time. Well, you know, if there's an expectation of permanency there, or at least semi-permanency, still this, this same dynamic would apply. Now, I mentioned that Wollstonecraft talks about some cautionary tales. And she brings up the idea about um, women who are not developing themselves, but are just sort of taking their cues from society about being um, you know, pleasant to men, getting themselves into relationships where they are in a one-down position where they're, they're um, uh, dependent. And how is that going to actually work out? It's interesting here because she also brings up uh, children, which are a natural outcome of, of sexual interaction, all right? So she says, um, supposing a woman trained up to obedience be married to a sensible man. So this is sort of a best case scenario. Who directs her judgment without making her feel the servility of her subjection to act with as much propriety by this reflected light as can be expected when reason is taken at second hand. So she's not thinking for herself. Her husband is guiding her, but he's guiding her very well. Um, she cannot ensure the life of her protector. So she's vulnerable. She says, he may die and leave her with a large family. And what happens then? A double duty devolves upon her to educate them in the character of both father and mother to form their principles and secure their property. But she's not up to the task. Why not? Because she never developed herself. She's only learned to please men, to depend gracefully on, on them. Yet encumbered with children, how is she to, to, to obtain another protector, a husband to supply the place of reason? If she doesn't do it herself, where is she going to get a good guy? Now, notice, you know, what Wollstonecraft says. Could this apply to our own time just as well? And might it apply to widowers just as much to widows? Well, let's, let's think about this. A rational man, though he may think her a pleasing, docile creature, will not choose to marry a family for love when the world contains many more pretty creatures. So if all that the person has to offer is, hey, I know how to please, and I know how to dress up nice, and I know how to talk nice, 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 nice. That's not actually going to do anything once you've already got uh, a bunch of kids around. Not for somebody who's actually rational, she's, she's saying. And I think this actually would work just as much in terms of men as women. So what's going to become of her? What are the kind of guys that she can actually get to come in and help out? Are they the, the ones who will actually be rational? She says, she falls prey to some mean fortune hunter who defrauds her children of their, their inheritance and renders her miserable or becomes the victim of discontent and blind indulgence. Unable to educate her sons or impress them with respects, um, it's not a play on words to assert that such people are not respected. So, you know, this is a problem. She's not able to raise her children well. She's not able to to secure another equally good uh, relationship. Uh, it can get worse, too. She says, I've taken for granted that she was well-disposed. Um, what about a woman who's not well-disposed? She says, supposing no very improbable conjecture that a being only taught to please must still find her happiness in pleasing, what an example of folly not to say vice will she be to her own innocent daughters. This is going to have some lasting effects. The mother will be lost in the coquette, and instead of making friends of her daughters, view them with eyes askance, for they are rivals. Rivals more cruel than any other, because they invite a comparison and drive her from the throne of beauty, who has never thought of a seat on the bench of reason. So again, this is actually introducing a kind of alienation of woman from woman within the very family, uh, Wollstonecraft is saying this, this, you know, education to please is, is very detrimental, not only to the woman herself, but even to her progeny. Um, she goes on and she says, well, let's contrast this to another case. What about a woman who actually did develop her understanding, who has allowed her body to acquire its full vigor, 
her mind at the same time gradually expanding itself to comprehend the moral duties of life and in what human virtue and dignity consist. Now her husband dies. Formed thus by the discharge of the relative duties of her station, she marries from affection without losing sight of prudence. She secures her husband's respect before it's necessary to exert mean arts to please him and feed a dying flame. Now he dies. And she says, her heart turns to her children with redoubled fondness and anxious to provide for them. Affection gives a sacred, heroic cast to her maternal duties. Um, what Wollstonecraft thinks that this woman is going to actually be able to do is successfully be independent and raise her children without bringing in some guy who's going to screw them up and screw her up because he's a screw up. So, you know, what, are, what is the, the, the ultimate uh, point here? Love is not what we should be looking for. Instead, we should be focusing on virtue.